The Paleozoic era is divided into the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian and Carboniferous periods, each with characteristic groups of fossils. The Ordovician period lasted almost 45 million years, beginning 488.3 million years ago and ending 443.7 million years ago. During this time period, the area north of the tropics was almost entirely ocean, and most of the world's land was collected into the southern supercontinent Gondwana. Throughout the Old Division, Gondwana shifted towards the South Pole, and much of it was submerged underwater. The Old Division radiation is an interval of intense diversification of marine animal life that unfolded over tens of millions of years during the Old Division period of geologic time. The interval was characterized by the emergence of organisms that would come to dominate marine ecosystems for the remainder of the Paleozoic era. The Ordovician radiation was an extension of the Cambrian explosion, an event during which all modern marine phyla appeared. The Ordovician is best known for its diverse marine invertebrates, including graptolites, trilobites, brachiopods, and the conodonts, early vertebrates. From the lower to middle Ordovician, the Earth experienced a milder climate. The weather was warm, and the atmosphere contained a lot of moisture. However, when Gondwana finally settled on the South Pole during the Upper Ordovician, massive glaciers formed, causing shallow seas to drain and sea levels to drop. This likely caused the mass extinctions that characterized the end of the Ordovician, in which 60% of all marine invertebrate genera and 25% of all families went extinct. So in order to understand the Ordovician period, we need to look at some of the most strangest creatures that existed during that mysterious period of time. Since their first appearance in the fossil record 530 million years ago, arthropods have been the most species-rich and morphologically diverse animal groups on Earth. They include such familiar creatures as horseshoe crabs, scorpions, spiders, lobsters, butterflies, ants, and beetles. Their success is due in large part to the way their bodies are constructed. They have a hard exoskeleton that is molded during growth, and their bodies and legs are made up of multiple segments. Each segment can be modified separately for different purposes, allowing arthropods to adapt to every environment and mode of life. A gyracassis, a reference to a mythological Norse giant and the Latin word for shield, swam through seas that covered what is now Morocco between 485 and 443 million years ago. The anatomy of Ajaracassis shows that animalocarids weren't technically arthropods, but the flaps along their bodies represent equivalent parts to arthropod limbs. In other words, animalocarids like Ajaracassis might provide a look at parts of the body plan that evolution co-opted and modified in true arthropods. A gyrocassis was one of the later animalocarids living in the Ordovician period, whereas most other currently known animalocarids seem to have been Cambrian. Earlier members are generally still perceived as predators. A gyrocassis, however, is noted as having frontal spines with a very fine mesh of further spine-like appendages that could have filtered planktonic organisms from the water. This likely makes A gyrocassis a planktonic filter feeder, not an active predator. This may also in part explain how it could grow so big, as not only is plankton abundant and nutritious, but also it requires very little energy expenditure to catch, meaning more calories can be diverted to growth and maintenance of large physical size. The idea of a gyracassis as a filter-feeding animalocarid also goes to show that nature has a habit of repeating itself. Animalocarids almost certainly started out as carnivores, with some then growing to truly gigantic size when making the switch to filter feeding. Fish too mostly started out as predators, but some like Lycictes, which lived much later during the Jurassic, attained massive sizes simply by filter feeding. In today's oceans, two of the largest sharks, the whale shark and basking shark, are both filter feeders. Whales too began their early evolutionary history as predators, but today the largest whales alive are all filter feeders. What Ajaracassis shows us is that this pattern of growing giant by switching to filter feeding is one that goes back at least as far as the Ordovician period, and with arthropods. Sacaban baspis was approximately 25 cm, 9.8 inches in length. The body shape of Sacabambaspis vaguely resembled that of a tadpole with an oversized head, flat body, wriggling tail, and lack of fins. It had characteristic frontally positioned eyes like car headlamps. 
The fossils of Sacabambaspis show clear evidence of a sensory structure, lateral line system. This is a line of pores within each of which are open nerve endings that can detect slight movements in the water, produced for example by predators. The arrangement of these organs in regular lines allows the fish to detect the direction and distance from which a disturbance in the water is coming. Although it had no jaws, the mouth of Sacabambaspis was lined with nearly 60 rows of small bony oral plates, which were probably movable in order to provide more efficient suction action through expansion and contraction of the oral cavity and pharynx. Arandaspis is an extinct species of jawless fish that lived in the Ordovician period about 480 to 470 million years ago. It is the oldest known vertebrate. Its remains were found in Ellis Springs, Australia in 1959, but it was not discovered that they were the oldest known vertebrates until the late 1960s. Arandaspis was about 15 cm 6 inches long with a streamlined body covered in rows of nobly armored scutes. The body of Arandaspis was long yet deep, with a single fin extending around the posterior half of the body. As such, Arandaspis is not thought to have been a particularly powerful or graceful swimmer, possibly propelling itself through the water with just a series of rapid yet slight, laterally undulating side-to-side -side body movements. Arandaspis also had two shields made from thin bone, the lower being deeper than the upper. These would have provided support for the body as well as degree of protection, but there were still gaps so that features such as eyes and gills were not obstructed. Arandaspis may have been a predator of other much smaller marine organisms. However, the mouth points downwards, suggesting that it may have been a bottom feeder, either scooping up small bottom-dwelling organisms or particles of organic matter that had fallen to the sea floor. Although Arandaspis was a jawless fish, it still believed to have had plates inside the mouth that allowed the lips to have been flexible. To a certain extent, this means that Arandaspis would have been able to manipulate things into its mouth. Conodont animals are widely recognized as an important group of early vertebrates with tooth-like structures that comprise the feeding apparatus that represents the earliest expression of mineralized skeletons among vertebrates. There is a general consensus that they were small eel-like animals that occupied a variety of niches in early Cambrian to late Triassic seas. Conodonts extensively diversified during the early Ordovician, reaching their apex of diversity during the middle part of the period and experienced a sharp decline during the late Ordovician and Silurian, before reaching another peak of diversity during the mid-late Devonian. Conodonts are used by geologists as an important tool for dating and correlating Paleozoic and Triassic rocks regionally and globally because of their abundance, their highly diversified and rapidly evolved morphology, and their wide distribution. For example, the Ordovician system can be subdivided into some 30 biosomes defined by conodonts and graptolites, each of which had a time span of less than 2 million years. This degree of resolution is not surpassed by any other dating method currently available. Crinoids have lived in the world's oceans since at least the beginning of the Ordovician period, roughly 485 million years ago. They may be even older. Some paleontologists think that a fossil called Ecmatocrinus from the famous Burgess Shale fossil site in British Columbia may be the earliest crinoid. The Burgess Shale fossils date to the Middle Cambrian well over 500 million years ago. Either way, crinoids have had a long and successful history on Earth. Crinoids flourished during the Paleozoic era, carpeting the seafloor like a dense thicket of strange flowers, swaying this way and that with the ocean currents. Massive limestones in North America and Europe, made up almost entirely of crinoid fragments, attest to the abundance of these creatures during the Mississippian. Mississippian rocks crop out only in the extreme southeast corner of Kansas, but crinoid fossils are common in Pennsylvanian and Permian rocks in the eastern part of the state. Crinoids are amazing living fossils. Even though they are not capable of colonial reproduction, as are some starfish and brittle stars, they can regenerate lost body parts. Crinoids came close to extinction toward the end of the Permian period, about 252 million years ago. The end of the Permian was marked by the largest extinction event in the history of life. The fossil record shows that nearly all the crinoid species died out at this time. The one or two surviving lineages eventually gave rise to the crinoids populating the oceans today. 
Like many invertebrate animals living today, including crustaceans, spiders, and insects, trilobites were arthropods belonging to the phylum Arthropoda. Geologists know that they were marine animals because of the rocks in which they are found. For support and protection, the soft parts of the animal were covered by an exoskeleton. Usually only the dorsal part of the exoskeleton covering the animal's back was fossilized. The ventral underside part of the animal may have been covered by a soft membrane or other material that could not be fossilized. Trilobites had compound eyes consisting of a number of separate lenses. The number of lenses and the complexity of the eye structure varied enormously. Some trilobites had large convex compound eyes with a large number of lenses, giving them a wide field of view forwards, backwards, sideways, upwards, and even downwards, depending on the actual curvature of the eye. Many trilobites were 1.1 to 2.4 inches long, but some, such as paradoxids, were giants up to 2 feet or more, while others, like the tiny blind agnostic trilobites, were not more than a few millimeters long. Trilobites appeared in the Cambrian period and became extinct at the end of the Permian period. In Britain, trilobites occur in rocks of Cambrian, Ordovician, and Silurian age, for example in Wales and the Welsh borderland in Devonian rocks of southwest England. These impressive animals could reach up to 10 feet in length, making them some of the largest animals alive at the time. They likely sported ten arms, but without suckers, and roamed the warm, shallow sea looking for food on the muddy seafloor. Like its cousin Camaraceras, and the Ceres had the generic orthoconic cephalopod body plan. It was a squid-like mollusk with tentacles long enough to capture food, a small mouth hiding between the circular row of tentacles, and a large straight shell. Its body would have been covered in smooth skin and mostly covered by its hard shell and the cerates laid relatively large eggs and hatched at a relatively large body size. It is likely that endocerates were demersal of the hatching, as large eggs would make an easy target for predators in the pelagic zone. Endocerates may have migrated from their habitat in the open ocean to shallower water to lay their eggs.